from like uh, 10 seconds, then you can probably start. Okay, sounds good. Oh, can you do me a favor and click the record button and then click uh, record to cloud? Actually, hang on. I'm going to take back. Can you make me the host real quick? Do you know how to do that? I think so. Okay. All right. I'm gonna... There you go. Oh, hello, everybody on Facebook. We'll get started in just here in just one second. We just need to make sure that we get this thing recording, and I'll turn it over to Austin from Runge. All right. We are recording, and we are live on Facebook. Austin, take it away. All right. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Again, my name is Austin, and I'm a naturalist with the Missouri Department of Conservation. And I'd like to thank you all for inviting me into your homes today through this very special live Zoom presentation that we have for you. Uh, I'm very excited today because today we're going to take a look at one of my favorite groups of animals in all of Missouri and actually all the world. Today we're going to study birds. Now studying and watching birds is a great way to spend time outdoors and it can be done anywhere including your very own backyard. Now what's really great about today is that we're not going to be studying birds so much in your backyard right now but we are going to be studying birds in my very own backyard because today we're not at a conservation area. We're not at the Runge Nature Center. We're standing on my deck overlooking my backyard, which is a great place to watch birds. Uh, over the last three years since I've, I moved in, in uh, a couple of years ago, uh, I have seen over 90 different species of birds in my very own backyard. I love waking up early in the mornings, getting out, uh, grabbing my binoculars, watching birds up in my trees, as I forage in my yard, uh, listening to the birds, which there's quite a few birds uh, singing right behind me right now, so it's kind of distracting for me. Uh, and watching birds at my feeder. So today we're going to take a look at how we can attract birds to our backyards, what equipment we, we might need in order to watch birds, uh, how to identify some birds, and kind of what things to look for overall when we're identifying birds. I'm not going to shoot every single bird that's out there because that would take a long, long time. Um, we might try and watch a few birds at my feeder real quick, and then we'll talk about different ways that we can help conserve birds. So I'm sure lots of you might have bird feeders at your very own home. And there's all sorts of things that we can do in order to attract birds, including using those bird feeders, but there's also some other things that we might try as well. Uh, so we're gonna go over here and take a look at some of the feeders and some of the food that I offer birds and some of the other things that I've done to my yard in order to help attract more birds into my yard. Um, so kind of bear with me, I'm my own cameraman today. Um, so we're gonna just kind of try the best that we can here real quick. Uh, so I'm kind of lucky. In my backyard, I have all sorts of oak trees. I have several post oaks, uh, a black oak, I got some hickory trees, um, and they're all very mature trees, which is a great way to attract birds with all these, these different trees. So I have a very, very good habitat. But there are other ways I can also help to attract additional birds to my backyard. One way is by offering a variety of different foods to these birds, because different types of birds love to eat different types of things. So a lot of you might have feeders, in which you might feed things like black oil sunflower seeds within those feeders. And that's what I have in my little red feeder that's hanging right there. Now these sunflowers are great for attracting a large variety of birds. Uh, almost all bird species love to eat black oil sunflowers, at least those that like to eat seeds. So on these sunflower seeds, I might see lots of goldfinches and house finches, things like cardinals and blue jays, uh, doves, all sorts of different critters love to eat these, these um, sunflower seeds. I also love finches. So I love to study things like goldfinches and pine siskins and house finches. And so I've also offered some thistle, which is the small black seed that we see in here. And this white seed is cracked sunflower seed. So they've already taken out the, sun, the actual meat of the sunflower seed out of the shell and they broke it up into smaller pieces. And finches really seem to love this. And so I get a variety of finches that love to come and feed on this particular type of food. And so if we look at my little yellow feeder there, that's what I have inside that little uh, yellow tube feeder. Um, during the winter time in this neighborhood, I'm not sure what it is about it, but I get a lot of pine systems, which are a very exciting bird. Uh, they're not super common throughout Missouri, but there's some winters that I get 30 here. And I think that this food is one reason that they love to come to my feeders in this neighborhood. Uh, they absolutely love it. Other foods that we feed, another common type, is something called suet. Suet is really rich in fat. Now, birds don't need a lot of fat this time of year, but they still like it anyway. But during the wintertime, this is a great source of fat for things like blue jays and woodpeckers and tip mice and chickadees. Uh, they love and I mean, just relish suets. 
and they'll come up there. It's a great, great source of energy for these birds, especially during those really cold months. Now, during this time of year, I start offering a couple of different types of foods that I wouldn't the rest uh, ordinarily offer the rest of the year. Um, one type of food that I offer is something that I also love to eat, which is oranges. And there's a whole lot of birds that love to eat oranges that we or no, don't ordinarily think about. Now, this time of year is migration. So there's a lot of birds that are moving from places like uh, Brazil and Central America. And in many cases, they're going all the way up into the Arctic. One group of these birds is called Orioles, which you may know about, uh, very colorful little members of the blackbird family. And they love to eat oranges, but not just Orioles. Also things like catbirds, mockingbirds, thrashers, and tanagers also love to eat oranges as well as things like woodpeckers, like our red-bellied woodpeckers. Now I've also offered some jelly and uh, jelly kind of attracts the same types of things that oranges do. Uh, so we got a lot of those birds that love to eat fruit will love to come to jelly. Now there's another bird that we get this time of year that just kind of shows up for the, um, during migration for the winter time, uh, coming their way north for the breeding grounds. And that's things like hummingbirds, uh, which there's actually, oh, I just scared away. I just had a hummingbird try and land on my feeder there real quick. Um, so this little glass bottle up here is hummingbird food. And hummingbird food is nothing special. It's just a concoction of one part water, and four, or sorry, one part sugar and four part water that we kind of blend together and put inside these special feeders. Uh, you may see where some people try and put like red food coloring and things like that inside their hummingbird feeders. Um, we actually prefer that you don't do that because in many cases, red dyes can be harmful to hummingbirds. And of course we don't want to hurt birds as we're trying to feed them. Um, but that one part sugar to four part water works very, very well. So we offer a lot of foods. Something else we might offer would be things like water. Now, just like people, uh, birds can go a while without food, but they can't go very long without water, especially when it's really, really warm outside. And so I have a fresh water source here, and there's a little bit of uh, debris in there, and I actually filled that last night. Uh, but as long as you have, some, have a clean water supply, you can attract birds using that water. And actually, I get more birds that show up in my backyard because of my water than I think I do my food. So water can be very, very important for attracting these birds. If you want to get a few more birds to show up, if you have some moving water, um, that helps attract them even further. Because not only can they see the water and they can see the water moving, but now birds, which have incredible sense of hearing, can hear the water and key in on that water to come in and try and get a drink or take a bath or do whatever that they might need water for. Uh, so if you have good habitat, things like nice trees, and you offer a variety of food and things like water, you could very well get a variety of birds within your very own backyard. So I'm going to sit you back up on my tripod here real quick. There we go, clicked in. Um, so now we've attracted all these birds to our backyard, which by the way, you don't have to go out and buy special store-bought feeders uh, to attract birds to your own, own backyard. You can create your own feeders as well. They don't have to be fancy. I've seen plans online where you can take a milk jug and make a feeder out of it. Uh, if you take a pine cone and you roll it in peanut butter and then roll it in bird seed, that can be a makeshift feeder. And you can even take some seed and scatter it on the ground or take a, a, a plastic plate, and punch some holes in it and put the seed in there uh, to attract birds. The only thing that we wanna be conscious of, especially when we're feeding seed, is to keep that seed dry and fairly fresh. So we don't want bird seed that's been sitting in the feeder and is all moldy, because of course that hurts things, uh, all of our different birds. So just keep the seed dry. Uh, whatever feeder you create or you go out and purchase, uh, that's just one of our qualifiers. Uh, so now we've attracted all these birds to our very own backyard. How do we go about watching? You know, there's a couple of pieces of equipment that make watching birds a little bit more enjoyable. Uh, one, the most special is a good pair of binoculars. Uh, with binoculars, you kind of get what you pay for. If you spend more money, you do get a higher quality pair of binoculars. And these are very valuable because all of a sudden we might see a bird across our yard and by using our binoculars, we can look through and bring that bird much closer so we can get a much better look at it, enjoy the bird a little bit more. And if we're concerned with identifying it, we can see it a little bit better to try and identify it. Something else that will help us with identification is something like a bird guide. Now there's a variety of bird guides out there and I'm not uh, saying get one over the other, uh, but a few bird guides that are very good, especially for beginner birders, are things like the Peterson guide, the Golden guide, and a Kaufman guide. All these birds are very good for beginners because they kind of, um, the books are set up that you can easily search the books uh, to try and figure out what types of bird it is that you're looking at. Um, so if you get a field guide and a pair of binoculars, you are, you are ready to go. Um, and again, one band's not necessarily better than the other, just kind of get what, whatever you can afford um, and, and you will find something that works out very, very well. 
Now, we're attracting birds and we have the equipment to watch birds, but how do we actually go about identifying birds? Within Missouri, there are well over 300 different species of birds that we'll see in a given year. And that's just Missouri. Within the entire world, there are over 10,000 different species of birds. Uh, so there's a lot of birds out there and no one book really contains all the birds and nobody knows all the birds. Uh, we just kind of learn them as we go. Um, so what things do we look at to help us identify those birds? Um, well, a couple of things that we look at are things like size and shape. Now, a lot of people want to go to color first, but size and shape can actually be more valuable. If I told you I saw a white bird, would you know what that is? Probably not with a little bit more description. If I told you I saw a white bird that was huge, very, very large, and had a long neck, well, then you might start thinking things like snow goose or swan. But then if I told you the bird had black on a wingtip that would rule out swan, but you still might be thinking snow goose. And then if I told you it had a great big, huge bill with a big pouch underneath. Well, all of a sudden we've kind of narrowed that down to pelican by using shape. Um, so size and shape are actually more important than things like color because they get us to a group of birds first, like a family of birds um, that we can break down a little bit further by their color. So size and shape are very, very important. Then we start looking at things like field marks and color. Now, field marks are anything on a bird that might appear distinctive. Uh, a good example might be um, when we're looking at things like a, a red-winged blackbird. We have this overall blackbird, but there's something very, very bright on their shoulders. That would be an example of a field mark. Other example might be a bird that has maybe an eye ring, a little circle going around his eye, or maybe a line that cuts through its eye instead. They might have speckling on the chest. We really need to look all over the bird, find these distinctive things. After we look at things like field marks and color, then we start looking at things like behavior and habitat. So certain birds act certain ways. You know, if we saw a bird that was clinging to the side of a tree and it was banging its head against the tree, uh, that would very, very quickly narrow that down to probably a woodpecker, although there are some other birds that could potentially do that as well. So we can look at the way it's behaving uh, and also where we find it. You know, if we were out looking for ducks, we probably wouldn't go to my backyard because I don't have any water in my backyard or any large source of water in my backyard uh, that would make a duck very happy. So it wouldn't be the place to go. So we can go to certain habitat, habitats to look for certain birds and we expect certain birds and certain types of habitat. My backyard does have all these nice oaks, but it's still fairly open. So I get lots of open woodland bird species and I can kind of expect those species. Uh, something else we can use is sound. Now it's kind of hard to see, but I have all sorts of birds singing around me right now. I can identify at least four different species uh, just by listening with my own ears at the moment. Um, and bird, learning bird, songs, bird songs can be fairly difficult, but as long as you get out there and give it a try, get some experience, it becomes fairly easy. You know, if we were out at night and we heard a sound like, whoo, 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 we would recognize that probably as an owl, in that case, a barred owl. Um, so we can actually, you know, it's surprising how many bird sounds we actually know by ear. Um, even without studying birds. But if you give it a little bit of effort, you can learn bird sounds very, very quickly, especially if you go out, look at the bird and listen to the bird at the same time. Uh, so now we're gonna do a couple of real quick examples here. So I have some uh, bird mounts with me. So these birds are no longer alive. Uh, and no, I did not kill them. Uh, they died from some other reason, They're either hitting windows or a variety of different things. And we mounted their bodies to look like they're alive so we can study them a little bit more carefully because usually birds don't let you get super, super close. Uh, so we're gonna take a look at some of these birds. And I just want you to take a second and try and figure out, you know, what important features can we look at on the bird uh, to help us identify it. So we're going to start with one that's fairly common throughout most backyards here in Missouri. Um, this little bird right here, I'll hold a little bit closer to the camera so hopefully we can see that. You know, it's a little bit dark there. Um, now remember what I said, si things like size and shape are most important. I know it's kind of hard to judge size through this video. Uh, but this bird is definitely smaller than my hand, so it's really not that big. Now, looking at the size and shape, the thing that stands out to me the most is the beak. This bird has a very heavy triangle-shaped beak. Its tail is very average, which, believe it or not, average is actually a very good size uh, marker to use as well. So it's not super long, it's not super short, um, and it's a fairly ch stout little bird. Um, so just by looking at the shape of this bird, I can tell that this bird is probably in the finch family. From there, we can look at things like the color on the bird. So if we're looking up the head of the bird up here, we see that there's a little uh, kind of like rosy, uh, rosy red color uh, throughout the head, a little bit of rosy red right here above the, above the tail. And the rest of the bird is fairly gray. 
Now, if I was looking at this bird alive, I might see this bird in my very own backyard, which is said it's kind of an open woodland uh, type setting. And I would see this bird perching and probably feeding on things like my, my finch food or my, uh, my sunflower seeds. And he also makes a fairly distinctive call that unfortunately I can't uh, imitate that one like I could the owl. So by looking at all these things, I could tell that first off it's a finch. From there, I could try and figure out what type of finch. So if I have my field guide, I could start in the finch section and kind of move my way back until I find the appropriate bird. Um, any ideas? This bird is a house finch. So we'll pull out my field guide here real quick and take a peek. And we can see that it is indeed a house finch. Hopefully it matches up just perfectly. Now this last book that I'm using isn't a very good field guide because it doesn't fit in your back pocket. Uh, but it's a very, very good like coffee table bird book. And yeah, there are people that are crazy enough to have bird books on their coffee table. Uh, and this is the Birds of Missouri book. And this has very good information about Missouri specific birds. And so that bird that we just had out is that male house finch. And so as we can see, it has that triangle stout bill, kind of average tail, uh, fairly stocky bird uh, body shape. Uh, we can see that rosy color on the head and throat and a little bit above the tail there and kind of uh, gray color throughout the back. So uh, by looking and observing that bird carefully, we can figure out what it is. Uh, let's try another one real quick. So here's another bird that we can see is behaving far differently than that house finch was. So by looking at the size and the shape, it's about the same size as that house finch. And lots of times when we're looking at size, not only are we looking at size of the individual parts on there, but overall body shape, and it's very good to compare it to other birds that we know. So knowing that this bird is about as big as a house finch is actually very, very helpful. Now we can see the beak on this bird looks completely different. It's really long and almost needle-like, very good for picking insects like out of bark. Uh, so this is a very good in insect uh, type bill. Now we can also look at this bird's feet, which maybe I can show you there, let's see. You well, can't see it all that well. Uh, this bird has very, very stout feet. Its feet are very good to, for clinging to the side of the trees, just like it's doing on this little log right here. Uh, so that's another very important thing, very stout feet. And it has a very short tail. Something else that I think is kind of striking is to, that this bird species to me seems like it has a very large head in proportion to its body. So we looked at the shape of this bird, which usually tells us what family it's a part of. And so this particular bird is a member of the nuthatch family. Then we can look at the field marks and the color on this bird to help figure out what species in that hatch. So I see a very dark top of its head, a white throat and a white breast, and kind of blue colors throughout its back. Now this bird's behavior is that it loves to climb head first down trees. It can climb head up and kind of go upside down too, but it's known for going head first down trees, which not very many other birds do. So that's something that's very, very distinctive, which again, kind of leads us to nut hatch. And you would definitely find this bird in an open woodland habitat, just like we're in right now. And actually, I just heard a couple of, a few minutes ago. Um, so this is totally appropriate. And we might see this bird eating uh, sunflower seeds, going to the suet, a variety of different things. Now, this one also has a very distinctive song uh, or sound. It kind of makes this very nasally uh, uh -uh, uh -uh, uh -uh, type sound, uh, which, would, which, you know, when I hear it, uh, makes it sound out immediately, of course, learning bird sounds or sounds is a little more difficult. Um, and so this is, like I said, a nuthatch. So let's turn to our nuthatch page and see what we can find. So in my Missouri book here, we get to the nuthatch page and we find that we have two typical types of nuthatch with Missouri, ones that we typically see. Uh, we see this little guy down here during the winter time, especially. Uh, sometimes during the fall and the spring, and we see this guy up here year round. So when comparing the two, we can see that this one has the dark cap, the white head, neck, and we can't quite see the breast there, but um, this bird is called the white-breasted nuthatch, so we can probably assume that it is white. Um, we see that blue-black color going through the back, that short tail, uh, large feet, that needle-like bill, and so we're looking at the white-breasted nuthatch versus this red-breasted nuthatch down here. So again, by observing that bird very carefully, we could look through our bird guide, uh, figure out what family it belongs to, and then figure out what species it is that we're looking at. Now, enjoying birds, you know, figuring out what they are is very enjoyable, but it's not 100% necessary if you're just going out there to enjoy birds. 
Um, just watching them, watch the way that they move and behave is also very, very gratifying. Um, you know, a lot of great fun to watch. Uh, so now what we're going to do is we're actually gonna, I'm gonna invite you inside my house, not too far inside my house because it might be a little bit messy, um, but we're gonna stand just in the doorway here and we're gonna see if a few birds might show up while we're hiding a little bit more. Right now I'm standing out on my deck a lot, this time of year especially, birds are kind of shy. Um, they don't wanna be seen too much. I don't, they've got crazy hair like me. They've been locked inside all, all the time, I don't know. Uh, so we're gonna step inside um, and kind of bear with me here. I'm gonna bring the phone up and try to look through my binoculars when we do get a bird that does show up. Uh, we'll just sit for a few minutes and see what we can see. If we don't find too much more, we'll kind of continue on. Um, but we'll give it a go anyway. And I do have birds all around me that I can see and hear here. So I'll flip our camera around, grab my binoculars. And we're also going to flip our camera here. So hopefully that doesn't screw you up too much. Again, I can hear a variety of birds out there right now. I hear some house finches. I can see some very distant robins. I can hear some chipping sparrows. I can hear some goldfinches. I can hear some house wrens. I can see a dove. So we'll try and take a look at that real quick here before we sneak into my house. Last work. I'm not trying to make any anybody sick here, um, just by completely by accident here. So we saw it just landed on the ground there. Um, and that's something that's very characteristic of doves. They love to spend a lot of time on the ground. Uh, they do perch up on wires and things like that, but they're not the most acrobatic birds when it comes to climbing around. But they're very good walkers. Uh, very plump birds with a small head. This happens to be a morning dove, so he has a very long tail, kind of a gray body overall, and some fairly distinctive markings on the head as well when we get a very careful look. But just by size and body shape and overall color, we can tell immediately that this is a, a morning dove. Trying to pick up my neighbor just mowed the other day. So I think he's picking up weed seeds that might have fallen after, after the mowing. Um, so I hear a few goldfinches getting a little bit closer. So let's go ahead and move inside and see if we can any goldfinches that move or come on in. And I'll take you off of my binoculars real quick so we don't get too sick on the way in. Like I said, we'll just give it a few minutes and see what does show up. This morning when I stepped outside, I heard about 12, or heard and saw about 12 species uh, within about two minutes. So uh, there really are a lot of birds around. Unfortunately, one o'clock in the afternoon is not the very best time to go out here and see birds because they're not quite as active as they would be uh, the rest of the day. Um, but like I said, my yard is a great place to watch birds. So hopefully we get a few more that show up here. Oh, Cardinal just flew by my window. Oh, there's a goldfinch that's showing up. Get you hooked back up to my binoculars so I can take a look if it comes in. Oh, there's a hummingbird. So we only have one species of hummingbird that breeds in Missouri. Uh, this is a ruby-throated hummingbird. That looks like a female. So it'd be fantastic if she had a nest uh, somewhere around here. Here we have another bird that showed up. I'm not sure if you can recognize that one or not. That is a bluebird, which is the state bird of Missouri. And so bluebirds actually related to robins. They have that similar type of body shape, a very good beak for eating like insects, but they do eat a variety of other things. Uh, it seems like my bluebirds especially love those sunflower hearts. Uh, that blue color over its back and its tail, that red breast and that kind of white towards its belly, towards its legs there. And I can hear some blue jays. Um, there's just a female goldfinch that landed on the backside of that same feeder. So kind of like the house finch, kind of a triangle shaped bill, average size uh, legs, a little um, stockier type bird. Um, she's kind of, well, there's a nice bright male bluebird. 
the one we were looking at earlier was a little grayer. That was a female. So we have a female goldfinch that just landed back on the back side of the feeder. But I got some male goldfinches now landing on top. So again, triangle shaped bill, average tail, um, fairly plump. Uh, but the males have bright yellow plumage, that black crown, black wings with white wing bars. And there's a female that just landed just there for a second. Sometimes they get a little competitive. There's plenty of food to go around, but they don't know that. And so we see those birds eating that, that finch food in that sunflower seed, which is actually have both those in that red feeder. Um, and we look at the female over here, another female over here. We know she's sitting on the suet, but not really interested in the suet. And we rarely see finches eat suet unless they're little pieces that break off. We'll give it one more minute and see if anything else shows up. That's actually pretty good. Uh, though it might not look like it. That kind of drab bird there um, is a female of a particular bird. So a lot of times we know that the females are drabber than the males are. Um, not sure where it landed there. Um, that was a female indigo bunting. So the males are bright blue. And the females are kind of characterized by having a lack of overall field marks. They're just, they're just a very plain bird. There's not a whole lot that's very distinctive. Here's another good bird. Uh, this is a young, a freshly uh, fledged Eastern bluebird. So I do have a bluebird house in my backyard and see mom feeding it there. So it's still fairly dependent on its mom at this point. But we can tell it's young by all that speckling it has there on the chest. Let's see what else we got back here. Just had a European starling land, which is not a bird we particularly like to see around here. Um, they love to eat suet, but they're what we call an invasive species. So they're from Eurasia and they moved in here and they take over the habitat of some birds like bluebirds. But it's nice to see that bluebird is nice and feisty and kind of chased it off. Let's see if anybody else shows up. Oh, I almost had a robin fly into my house. I did have a catbird land. They really like jelly, but I think I'm a little too close to my jelly feeder from in here. Oh, there he is. So there's a gray catbird, um, overall gray in color, a little bit longer bill, longer tail. And he had a little bit of red right under his, uh, right under his tail on his kind of his backside of his belly near his rear end. Um, and so that's a member of the mimic family. So that'd be things like uh, catbirds and thrashers and mockingbirds. But uh, I think we'll go ahead and head back outside here and kind of wrap things up. I could sit here and watch birds all day, but um, I should probably get back to doing some real work at some point too. So uh, hopefully we don't spook our birds too bad moving out here, but we'll take you off my binoculars so you can kind of see as they fly away maybe. There they go. It's kind of neat, it's during the winter time, these birds are usually a lot more, uh, um, willing to be around people. So there's times where I could just stand right out here and I wouldn't even need my binoculars to show you the birds. They'd just be sitting right there, just feeding away. But this time of year, they seem like they're just a little bit more shy. All right, so now I'm back. So it actually worked out pretty well. I'm glad we saw the number of species that we did. Uh, you know, this time of year is a great time of year. If you go out on the right day um, and you really know your birds, you could easily count over hundred different species of birds on a given day. Of course, not probably sitting in my backyard, but if you moved around to a variety of habitats, you could see all sorts of different types of birds. Um, but so far this year, up to this point, which is only May, uh, I've seen about 65 different species of birds in my backyard. So that's from January one to now. Um, so I think that's pretty good. And I haven't birdied back here quite as much as I, I really would like to. So uh, like I said, just sitting in one location seems fantastic. So today so far, we've take it, taken a look at how we could track birds to our backyard, equipment we might need to look at birds and study birds a little bit more carefully, things like field guides and binoculars. Um, we kind of took a look at how to identify birds, which takes lots and lots of practice, so kind of stick with it. And of course, with being with the department, uh, you can give us a call at any time. We're more than happy to help you kind of work through a bird identification, especially if you have a picture, because pictures are worth a thousand words. Um, we had a good chance to watch birds, and we saw, what was that, five different species there pretty easily. Um, 
and we were seeing a few more kind of further off in the yard here. Um, but now let's talk about how we can conserve birds because hopefully we at least care a little bit more about birds after watching this little presentation than we did before. And again, they are fantastic animals. Um, there was a recent paper that came out uh, back in the fall of 2019 uh, that stated that one in four birds that were around in 1970 is now gone. Meaning that we've lost about a quarter of our bird population over the last 50 years. Now that's kind of a problem for those of us that really love to see birds because it means there's not as many birds around anymore. So what are some ways that we can help conserve birds so we can see more birds in our backyard? And you know, there's some very broad things that we can do like create conservation areas and do all these things, but there's things that you can also do in your very own backyard and in your daily lives that will also help birds. Now, as I mentioned, I had these dead bird mounts here and you know, they, they may have died by running into things like so something we can do is we can take windows and try and research ways to make them bird safe. There's a variety of different methods out there when we search online that we can do to make these, these a little bit more bird safe. Uh, sorry, singing goldfinch right here. Um, we can do things like putting up lots of decals. There are special things that we can stick onto our windows so that birds are less likely to see the reflection of the sky and try and fly through it, or see right from one window of our house to the other window of our house and try and fly through. We can even do things as simple as closing our blinds when we're not at home. Sometimes that will cut down on glare, so birds are less likely to run into our windows on accident. We can also do things like use lighting outside responsibly. Like I mentioned, these birds, in many cases, are flying from places like Brazil all the way to the Arctic in many cases. Now, they usually do this at night. And we have leave our porch lights on. Uh, that kind of screws up their migration. So shut your porch lights off at night. Close your blinds at night so you're not leaking any light pollution out of your house. And that was something else that will help uh, birds migrate and make them less likely to crash into buildings and fly a little bit lower. Uh, which of course often results in the case of deadness, which is not great. Uh, so we can um, um, make windows safe and keep our lighting safe. Something else that we can do, or we can grow baby bird food, which it actually isn't that, that hard. Uh, by growing baby bird food, I'm talking mostly about insects, especially soft-bodied insects, things like caterpillars that baby birds love to eat. Now one chickadee, which we did not see today, which is a small bird about this big, uh, a little bit smaller than our house finches, when they're raising their babies, chickadees need to gather about 6,000 caterpillars in order to feed their babies just in the time it takes for them to hatch until when they leave the nest. Now that's a lot of caterpillars. So how can we help raise caterpillars? And I'm not suggesting we bring them into our home, but there are some things that we can do. Uh, number one, be a lazy gardener. Mow less, let the weeds grow up in your yard. Those are better for our insects and there's more insects that will help feed those baby birds. That's not hard to do and it's actually very easy to do. I love being a lazy gardener. Uh, if you go from mowing your lawn once a week to once every two weeks, uh, that can definitely help out some birds. Uh, something else we could do, or we can remove invasive plants from our yard and grow native plants. So if you have things like uh, Bradford pears growing in your yard, Bradford pears are not from, uh, not from the US and they don't harbor a lot of caterpillars. There was a study that was done where a gentleman walked around uh, one Bradford pear tree and he found one caterpillar of one species. Then he did the same thing to an oak tree and he found several hundred individuals of 19 different species of caterpillar on that one oak tree, just at head height. He wasn't climbing all the way to the top to find these things. So an oak tree, which is a native species, is much more likely to harbor a lot more caterpillars to help feed those baby birds. So take out the invasive, take out the exotic species and plant things like natives. We can also take that to herbaceous plants as well, rather than growing um, you know, a variety of, of fantastic looking plants that we can buy at things like Lowe's and the Home Depot and those types of places, uh, grow some native plants instead. Um, so things like our, our milkweed, um, a variety of different things I have over here. Um, I've got a few native plants that I've started. Um, have some rose verbena, which a variety of pollinators will use and some insects will eat. Very pretty little flower. And like I said, it's just starting out so it'll get more beautiful as we go. A sedum, uh, which has a, a nice little white flower that just finished up. Uh, very good for a variety of pollinators. And then we have things like columbine, uh, which some pollinators will use, but more importantly for things like things like um, hummingbirds, they'll actually nectar on these as well. So grow a variety of plants that are native to the, your area uh, will definitely help these birds uh, not only feed them, but help feed their babies, especially. Something else that we can do to help grow baby bird food, or we can do things like using pesticides responsibly. So rather than blanking our yard and pesticides, if you have to treat the pesticides, kind of do a spot treatment, use it responsibly and in moderation. Um, 
which will not only help birds and help the, the bird food, but also help our water quality and a variety of other things as well. So make windows and lighting safe, grow baby bird food. Something else we can do is shop for birds. I'm not saying go to the store and try and buy birds, but when you're buying things, keep birds in mind. So if you're a coffee drinker, um, try and find coffee that's sustainably sourced, uh, maybe shade grown coffee. Um, you know, a lot of these birds that we're looking at today, like I said, they came from South America where lots of coffee is grown. Uh, if the demand for, for uh, coffee goes up, uh, you know, rainforest gets cut down, coffee plantations get planted, and those coffee plantations can't support as many birds as a, a rainforest can. Um, so shade grown coffee is kind of the, the in-between there. Um, you know, even better yet, if you can if you cut back on your coffee, um, that's something else that can be very, very helpful. But beyond coffee, you can also buy a variety of other foods out there uh, that are sustainably sourced. Uh, things like um, you can buy um, the Audubon certified beef. And so that's beef that's grown in such a way that affects birds less. They put fewer cattle out on the, out on the area, uh, out on the pasture. They have more uh, uh, forbs within that, that area, which helps support more bird life, but supports more insects. So uh, shop for birds as well. And then this one seems so easy, but it's, it's, I don't, it's, it's just people don't quite always uh, do it, I guess. Um, keep your cats indoors. It's not exactly known how many birds um, get eaten by cats every year in the U.S., but the estimate is in the billions with a B, which is a lot of birds. In my very own backyard, I don't see cats in my backyard all often because I tend to chase them off whenever they do enter into my backyard. Not maliciously, but just getting them out of here. Um, I've seen over eight different cats, individual cats that I've seen from my backyard. And I know some of these are owned, some of them are feral. Uh, but keeping cats indoors is something that can um, definitely help save some save some birds um, as well. Because I mean that's that's a direct killing. Those cats don't need to eat birds to survive because they're being fed other things as well. Um, if you can't keep your cat indoors, consider putting it on a leash so it's less likely to be able to roam to find birds, especially baby birds. Uh, those baby bluebirds have no defenses against cats. They can barely fly, let alone know what a cat is. Um, so use things like a leash or build something like a catio. A catio is an enclosure that you can put it right outside your window. Uh, open up the window, the cat gets into this enclosure, but can't roam throughout the rest of the neighborhood. It's also a great way to keep your cat safe uh, because the, one of the number one threats to cats besides people are other cats that go in, they fight and do different things, um, which of course is not very healthy for them either. So um, catios, keep them on leash, but keep cats indoors, keep them confined in some way that they can't go out there and capture birds. Oh, I just got a question here real quick, guys. What kind of birds are in the Branson area? There are all sorts of birds in the Branson area, um, hundreds and hundreds of different species. What's really cool about the Branson area is that uh, you're kind of down there in the Ozarks and that um, um, kind of where the prairie and the Ozark meet. So you get a variety of different birds. Um, some of my favorites that are commonly seen down in Branson uh, are things like greater roadrunners, which a lot of people don't even realize are actually real birds, but roadrunners are real. We see those far more uh, kind of in Southern Missouri and Southwest uh, Missouri. Uh, things like painted buntings are around Missouri, uh, are around Branson. Um, but I mean, there, there's a huge, huge variety. Um, it would take me a while to make a list, but there are there are quite a few. So you're in a you're in prime bird viewing spots down there. Um, something I didn't mention, uh, you know, there are birding clubs all across Missouri. Um, if you really are interested in birds, join one of those birding clubs. They sometimes need field trips, and if you want to kind of elevate your uh, going out there and looking at at birds, uh, that's a great way to do it from experts that that are kind of local. Um, but yeah, great, great uh, bird viewing down in the Branson area. Yes, yep, so painted bunnings, they are a little more difficult to find. Um, you gotta look in the right spot, but they're definitely down there and, and are down around Branson more so than the rest of Missouri. We did have one here in Jeff City last year, uh, but it's kind of something that happens every couple of years, it seems like, so um, very, very cool. But yeah, Branson's a great spot to go out and get, get do some birding. Um, so we were talking about ways that we can conserve birds. So we're talking about windows safe, or keeping windows, um, making windows safe for birds and our lighting safe for birds. Goldfinches are starting to move back in here. Um, growing baby bird food, shopping for birds, keeping cats indoors. And the last thing is actually the easiest step. And that's just getting out and enjoying birds and sharing your joy with birds with other people. Uh, the more people get excited about something, the more likely they are to want to try and save it. Uh, so if you share that joy with people, um, die bomb by hummingbirds um you know they, they can feel that joy and they're going to want to take action eventually so definitely get out there and share that joy that you have with birds 
Um, so I hope we had a good time learning about birds again in my very own backyard today. Now it's time to get out in your backyard and learn all about birds. Uh, so we talked about ways that we can attract them, equipment you might need, how to identify birds, and a chance to watch birds, and different ways that we can help birds. Because uh, again, bird watching is a great time. Um, it's awesome to get outside and, and watch all these different things, all these different birds, and it's something that you can do in your very own backyard. So I have more, a couple more questions here. If anybody else has any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. So let me see if I can find it here real quick. Oh, got attacked by a brown thrasher. Attack. Okay. Um, that sometimes happens. So the, the comment was that they had a brown thrasher attack them um, because they thought they were getting too close to the baby. And, and that does happen sometimes. Um, my, my wife, who uh, when I met her, she was terrified of birds uh, because she went out into her backyard trying to rescue a blue jay, a uh, baby blue jay. The blue jay parents didn't know she was trying to rescue it. They started dive bombing her. And uh, yeah, birds oftentimes are very good mothers. So they'll kind of get after you. Uh, you know, overall, birds can't can't really hurt us. You know, we're big, strong animals. Uh, the biggest bird in Missouri is a trumpeter swan, and they're so big they don't even really know how to fight. Uh, you know, you look at things like turkeys. You know, they're they're terrified of people. So as long as you're not physically grabbing a bird, uh, they they really can't do much to hurt us. But uh, uh, they can give us a fright, that's for sure. And, and moms and and daddy birds protecting their babies that's that's one case where that might happen. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, folks, if there's no other questions, uh, I'd again like to thank you all for inviting me into your home. And then again, uh, for, well, for me inviting you to my very own home here. Um, I hope you had a great time. And again, get outside in your own backyards, study those birds. Uh, if you have any questions, make sure you give the Department of Conservation a call. We're more than happy to help you guys out with anything that you have. Um, but I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. And again, uh, go birding.